If there is ever a time where you should pay attention to a very important subject, the time is now. Because I believe you will be blessed as a result. All right, folks, let's get into this one. I have to tell you, this is not a joke. This is serious. All my videos are pretty serious. Of course, I'm always kind of funny at certain points, but this one is such an important video. And the reason why is because it really does pertain to the moment in which we are living. We have seen everything happen in this last couple of weeks, whether it be from the attempted assassination of Donald Trump to uh, the craziness that has gone on with Joe Biden, what's going on with the presidency and the run for it, the destabilization that we are watching in governments around the world, computer systems failing, things that are happening that are literally unprecedented, more than ever, the message that you are about to hear is critical. Folks, I did this a while ago and it seems prophetic. This is a real deal. This is a real conspiracy. These things are really happening. And the ultimate of all the conspirators is the one that the Bible warns us about the most. It's really critical that you pay attention to this. I think you'll be blessed for it. God bless you. I hope you enjoy it, guys. I'd really appreciate it if you left some comments. Let me know what you think. I do my very best to read as many of the comments as come in. Sometimes it's very hard with as many as happen. I really hope you're blessed by this. I believe you will be. Let's go to the book of Genesis. We're going to go there. I'm going to, I, I briefly have to bring this up because this is like really, really, really important. We have to go right to the beginning. We have to get into the discussion that we have had on multiple occasions regarding the fall of mankind and how man chose to yield itself to the enemy and what the enemy did in order to do and accomplish what he has accomplished so far and continues to accomplish. So let's get into this for just a second because once we start here, then we can build on the foundation that we're laying because I want everybody to understand this. When we look at the term conspiracy theorist, that was a term that was invented by clandestine operators that work for our country, okay? That was done a long time ago. And the CIA did a very, 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 very good job of making anybody who speculated on any level of conspiratorial action in any way look like they were complete kooks. This was something that they did. They did it on purpose. And I think that this is something that we also have to understand because if we don't understand this, then we're going to have a very, 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 very difficult time putting everything together. This is how Satan operates. I want to make myself clear before I read this passage. Satan will deceive you primarily in two remarkable ways. The first way that he will deceive you is by getting you to believe that what is happening right now in the current moment has nothing to do with anything that can harm you or destroy you. And thus, you will not engage in seeking to correct the problem that you observe or supposedly ignore or choose not to observe. In other words, one of the most effective tactics of the enemy is to beat you at war by making you think there is no war. So if you don't think you're in a war, then you're not going to engage. And if you don't engage, well, then, quite frankly, it doesn't matter. It's one of the ways that Satan does what he does. And he's very, very, very good at it, right? I mean, imagine if you walk into a war field where people are shooting at you and you don't believe you're at war. You don't believe people are going to shoot at you. You don't believe people are trying to take your life. You don't believe that your way of life is at risk. You don't believe your family's at risk. And you just walk them through. Doing that is such a unique picture of how Satan works. Let me give you another example of this. We have some really amazing people that live right next to us. Really, really great people. Actually, our whole neighborhood is filled with really amazing people. We've got evangelists that live in our neighborhood. We have people, I mean, they're not evangelists like professionally, but they they just, they preach the gospel to everybody. We have people in our neighborhood that are Christians today because of one of my neighbors, Ernie, who's actually preached the gospel to more people than you can shake a stick at. It's kind of a funny, very, very funny thing to see how God has just transformed everybody's lives. 
There's one family in particular on, on our neighborhood, and we have a lot of great families in our neighborhood, but one family in particular who uh, the wife is an attorney. And by the way, she's a very accomplished one. She's a really sharp one. And she's one of these physically fit kind of go-getters. She's very busy lady. She works very hard throughout the day. Um, her husband and her son are, are, are all the same way. Her children, her whole family, she's, she's very much the same way. They're all the same way. And a few nights ago, my wife witnesses or observes spots a coyote. Now, we have those. They're pretty common in our neighborhood. Matter of fact, in Single Hill, we see a lot of coyotes all over the place. We see this coyote the other day. And as we do, my wife goes in because she's got the dog with her. But I notice it's a relatively warm night. When I say warm, I mean, it's not like super warm, but it's not super cold. So there's a lot of people walking around. So when they walk, you know, when a coyote is alone, it's not all that big of a deal. But when they walk with other coyotes in the neighborhood, then you have to really kind of be concerned. So I get in my car and I'm like, I'm going to go see if I can kind of bow, blow my high beams at him and shoo him away because that's kind of how it works. And they end up going into the like over where the riverbed is and kind of do their own thing. So I get in my vehicle and as I get into my vehicle, I notice there are tons of people walking around and they're walking around with their little tiny dogs. So as I'm going through the neighborhood, I'm warning everybody, hey, be careful, there's coyotes around the corner. Be careful, there's coyotes. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A couple people, oh, don't worry about that. I got my gun on me, you know? <laughs> it's kind of funny. But I go around and I warn everybody. And then I see this girl who's an attorney who's one of our neighbors. And I, and I kid you not, I tell her, hey, be careful, there's coyotes out there. She says, oh, I saw them. And I chased them away. I actually ran after them, told them to get out of here. I'm like, <laughs> so I, I will give it to this woman. She's a brave, courageous lady that's really tough. I, I, I will tell you that. But I think sometimes what the devil will do is he will get us to behave exactly the same way that that attorney did. And let me explain that. By the way, that attorney is not a devil. She's a really wonderful lady. She's sweet, smart, brilliant, you know, just a really wonderful lady. But I'm bringing this up because I think there has to be a part inside of you that says, I'm not concerned about something damaging me if you're willing to go right in its face and just say like, no big deal, right? What the devil does is worse because what the devil will do is bring you to a place unlike the coyote situation. He will bring you to a place where you don't even have a chance to calculate what's in front of you. In other words, that lady who was jogging that night knew the coyotes were there. She's had experience with them. She's chased them away. She's ran them off before. Nothing about what she's done is something that she has not seen or been a part of before. And certainly nothing about what she was doing exhibits whether or not she's aware of what's going on around her. She very clearly understands what's happening. But she's making a calculated risk, understanding that engaging with the coyote could be very dangerous. Okay? Now I'm going to modify that illustration for just a second. Let's pretend that same woman is jogging in the neighborhood. And there are 15 coyotes that are following her. They're drooling. They're ready to go. And she's walking as though there's nothing there. It's only a matter of time before those coyotes destroy her. But she doesn't care because not only does she not see them, but she doesn't want to see them because of the state of her mind. Somebody, somehow, somewhere told her that if you pretend nothing is going on, then everything is going to be okay. That's exactly what Satan does. That's the first tactic that the, that the enemy deploys. And he's very good at it. It's one of the most significant ways that he seeks to attack us. The second way, this one is also like unbelievable. And by the way, he does it a bunch of other ways, but these are the two, I would just say most prominent ways. Is he looks for ways to teach people to embrace wickedness and while doing so, cast aspersion on the truth. 
Think about that for a second, okay? If he can get you to embrace wickedness while at the same time casting aspersion on the word of God, then what he can do in essence is he can get you to do anything that you feel like you want to do, knowing full well that whatever happens will destroy you, right? You wake up in the morning, you're not walking with God, you hate God, there's nothing about you that wants to do anything with God because you've somehow convinced yourself that you don't like him for whatever reason. And then you want to feel good. So you go do whatever is going to make you feel good. You go, you find a sexual partner, you go and uh, consume drugs, whatever it might be. But the reality of it is many people that live that way have already fallen victim to the second tactic of the enemy. One of the things that we don't realize, and I think this is even more significant, perhaps the most significant aspect of all of this, is that when these tactics are deployed, they require conspiratorial action. Let me say that again. When both of these tactics are deployed at their perhaps most significant level, they require conspiratorial action. It is not something that actually requires very little thought. It is something that requires intricate and very, very well thought out action. The devil just doesn't wake up in the morning and say, oh yeah, this is just a great idea, right? Uh, the, you know what? This is, you know, let's just try to, let's just try to throw him off. No, he has thousands of years of experience doing this. And he spends time thoroughly planning his action. And once the action is thoroughly planned, he effectively executes. And one of the principles that the enemy understands and understands it well is actually a biblical principle and one that we have to learn how to lean on. And that is the fact that when you come together with other like-minded people, your effectiveness in the very goal that you have to accomplish something increases substantially. When you choose to be one man on one island, you are never effective. But when you choose to allow yourself to find people who are like-minded, who are receiving the same marching orders from the same commander-in-chief, you find yourself in a position where you become a whole lot more effective. By the way, some of the most wealthiest people in the world understand this principle. They understand that they have to corroborate with people. They have to employ some level of collaboration because if they don't, they're never going to be able to leverage whatever asset they have to be able to bring the greatest return. If we can apply a principle like this to something as easy and simple and basic as money, imagine the kind of tactic that the enemy is deploying to seek to destroy your soul. Here's the thing about conspiracies as they relate to the devil. When he deploys them, he plays for keeps. He is so good at deploying his tactics that his conspiratorial effort oftentimes utilizes people that he's victimizing. So, so think about it like this, because this is where it gets real interesting, right? You have to, you have to really picture this because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove this to you. In the book of Genesis, when we think of a conspiracy, the very first thought that goes through our head, it's a, it's a real simple thought, right? The very first thought that goes through our head is, oh, yeah, look, these, man, that's kind of crazy. These guys are like duking it out uh, or, or figuring out a way to duke it out with this other guy. And you've got all these evil people that are sitting in like the star chamber and they're sitting down and they're, they're figuring out a way to make it miserable for their enemy. Well, the devil might do that every now and again. But where he becomes the most effective is he identifies a victim. Then once he identifies the victim, which by the way, all of mankind is, is his victim. That's why he's called the enemy. That's why he's called Satan. He is the adversary, okay? But this is what he does. Pay attention to this, folks, because it's really important. He identifies, listen to me closely. He identifies the victim that he seeks to exploit, and then what he does is he utilizes very commonly 
one or two of the tactics that we just talked about. Then what he does, which is really important that we catch this, is he utilizes the victim that he is targeting to become a co-conspirator without them knowing they're co-conspirators to allow his effectiveness to be leveraged in a way that damages the largest group of people that he can damage. This is why he targets people like pastors first. This is why he goes out of his way to target people that are in the highest, most influential circles because in his mind, if I can figure out a way to cause somebody to be given to sin and I can get myself to that place where they completely allow themselves to capitulate to the desire of their flesh, then I can turn them into a co-conspirator. And even though they don't see it, even though they don't understand it or know it, they will start working with me in order to destroy human life. Just so that you know, and this will be a major spoiler alert before I read the story. But just so that you know, the devil did this with Adam and Eve. You understand that, right? The devil actually deceived Eve. And once Eve was deceived... Eve became a co-conspirator with the devil. You might say, well, it's very difficult to be a co-conspirator when you, as the co-conspirator, lack intent. Problem is, one co-conspirator's intent might be different than the grand conspirator. The grand conspirator's intent may center around this nefarious ideal that he wants to destroy the very soul of every single person that he touches. The intent of the co-conspirator might be developed in a way that seeks what they think is going to be a better option for their lives, not understanding that they are setting them and their family down a path of destruction. So both conspirators don't have to have the same nefarious intent but they can still be conspiring together. You guys understand what I'm saying? It's important that we understand these terms. If we don't understand this, we're never gonna understand the tactic of our enemy. We're never gonna understand how he does what he does and why he chooses to do what he does. So let me demonstrate this concept or this principle to you from the Bible because it's really, 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 really important that you guys see this, okay? Look what it says, and the Bible tells us this, guys. Look, I'm going to start right from the beginning of chapter three. It says this. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. Okay, can we just stop for just one second and point out one very important thing? Can we point out the fact that this serpent, which we already know is Satan, was more cunning than anything else or anybody else? Okay, you, do you understand the word cunning here is a super critical word for us to be able to grasp? Because when we look at the word cunning, what cunning does is it brings us to a place of realization where we begin to understand that there is deep-rooted nefarious intent built into the action of the person that's being described here. When we talk about cunningness, as the King James is using it here, as the Bible chooses to use it, the picture is that there is a very honed-in skill set that is designed to take advantage of any vulnerabilities that are previously identified by that person and exploit those vulnerabilities and then convert, once those vulnerabilities have been exploited, convert the victim into that place of functioning as a co-conspirator. So the Bible right off the bat warns us. I mean, immediately the Bible warns us and says, hey, this, this, this devil here, he's more cunning than anybody else. Think about that. That's a very, very heavy warning. So he's very cunning. And look what it says. He said to the woman, this is to Eve, he's talking to Eve. 
He approaches her. By the way, why does he approach her? I'll tell you why. The grand conspirator, Satan, approaches Eve because he already recognizes a vulnerability in her condition. There are two major vulnerabilities, by the way, in Eve that we have to talk about, and they're critical that you understand these vulnerabilities because it is very easy for you to shield yourself from these vulnerabilities if you look at them biblically. The first vulnerability that he identified, and this is absolutely critical, is the fact that he went to a person that did not hear the word of God directly. He went to a person that heard the word of God secondarily. God spoke to Adam and Eve heard from Adam what God had said. Now, the way you shield yourself from that vulnerability is you get yourself into this book as much as you possibly can and allow yourself to be put in that place where you are not going to be vulnerable. If you have direct knowledge of the word of God, the likeliness of the capitulation to the type of vulnerability that comes from not knowing the word of God is diminished. If you go to me and you say, God said, and I know what God said because I read what God said, I heard what God said, you're never going to be able to tell me anything differently. It's just that simple. As a matter of fact, as a father and as a husband, it's my responsibility to make sure that my children will never experience that vulnerability. So what do I do? I go, to my, I go out of my way every single day. I read the Bible to my children. We read the word to our children. It's critical. Why? Because I do not want my children to be in the same place that Eve was. So it's the first vulnerability that Satan exploits. The second vulnerability that he exploits, and this one is even more significant, and it is one that we have to understand, is the emotional vulnerability. He understood the fact that Eve had a greater tendency to yield to the emotional state, especially when that emotion is being produced by a desire to want to make her and her family better. So what do we do? We guard ourselves from the place of allowing our influences, our emotions to influence us by spending time regularly communicating with the Lord. If we're regularly communicating with the Lord, then the vulnerability that comes from having that emotional tendency begins to go away because you're allowing your emotions to be on display before God. And then God does something to regulate those emotions and it continues to change things. Eve was vulnerable on both of those levels. Now, this is not going to be me teaching through Genesis chapter 3. So I'm going to very quickly read through this because I just, I just want you to understand the picture overall. So he goes to the woman and he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of the, of the garden? Okay, this, this is really interesting because what the devil does here, and it's really important, is he casts, immediately casts dispersion on the word of God by going to the woman and saying, did God actually say that? Again, if you have the vulnerability of not knowing the word of God, you're not going to be able to deal with the problem that comes from not knowing God's word, right? So she is now going to respond by repeating what she believes her husband told her. And by doing so, she's not going to accurately quote the word of God and then the devil will take advantage of another vulnerability that we haven't talked about. Look what happens. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall what? Not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Uh-oh. You guys understand how this works? You start wrong, and then it begins to tailspin from there. She didn't hear directly from God. She heard from Adam. By not hearing directly from God, by not hearing from Adam, and by having a very emotional tie to the condition that she finds herself in. Remember, this is Satan converting a woman into a co-conspirator. Okay, I just want you to see this. Okay? She says something that God never said. She said... Well, let, me, let me read this to you one more time. She said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. God didn't say you shouldn't touch it. God said you shouldn't eat it. 
So she added another restriction. Now you guys know what happens next. And this is where it gets really interesting, right? Then the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not, or you will not surely die. For God knows in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know what the best thing about grand conspirators are? Well, he is the grand conspirator. But the best thing, the, one of the most, ad, let me just say this, effective characteristics that exist with Satan is when he lies to you, he will not lie so blatantly and openly that the lie is obviously in your face. He will lie in a way that he gives you just enough truth that's twisted where it actually sounds believable and then you buy it hook, line, and sinker and you destroy your life. This is how Satan works. And folks, I cannot, I absolutely cannot emphasize this to you enough. The devil is good at what he does here, okay? And, and, and notice what he does. He gives a partial truth. Well, you're not gonna die yet. Well, you physically may not die when you eat it, but your soul is going to die, right? Well, your eyes will be opened. Well, yeah, your eyes will be opened, but they will be open to the wrong thing. And the shame and the pain and the suffering and the embarrassment and the depression and all the other things that you never felt because your eyes were never open to it, you're now going to start feeling it all. You see, the devil only told part of the story. He didn't tell the whole story. That's very important that we understand this. Super critical that we recognize this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit of it and ate. And then it says she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Did you notice that? He received it from his wife who gave it to him. She immediately took of that fruit, disobeyed the word of God, or was deceived, and then immediately she takes it and hands it to her husband. Hey, eat this. She became the co-conspirator. All of it was based on a lie. All of it was based on a lack of understanding of the cause and effect of an action that could so easily destroy a person's life. And what's even more sad about this is when you go back and you look at the moment when God created mankind, God told them, this is really interesting. As a matter of fact, let's let's I'm going to just turn over there in Genesis chapter 1 because I want you to see what God said. God says this in Genesis chapter 1. And then God blessed them. This is verse 28. And God said to them, notice this, we've got several commands here, five to be specific. Right? He says number 1, be fruitful. Number 2, multiply. Number 3, fill the earth. Number 4, subdue it. And number five, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth. Be the ultimate consumer. You have everything. Here's the thing that's so crazy about the story that I just read you. It's crazy. Please think about this for a second. God told Adam and Eve, you can have it all. Everything. There's nothing on the earth that does not belong to you except this one thing. Don't touch the tree. Here's my thing. Let's think about this for a second. If God came to me and he said, here is a trillion dollars, or forget that. Let's just say he gives me every last dime known to mankind on this earth. He says, it's all yours. You can do whatever you want with it. But by the way, there's a penny right there on the floor. Whatever you do, you leave that penny where it is. Don't touch it. You know what I would do? I would take epoxy. Like literally. I would take a wooden structure, build it around that penny, and I would pour epoxy on that penny. And then I would nail it to the ground and build the world's largest fortress around it. And I would literally make it impossible to even look at. Why? I got all the money in the world. Why do I want that penny? 
Why in the world would I want that penny? I got every dime to my name. See what the devil did? If you don't have the word of God, then you are not reminded of the fact that all was yours, Eve. If you don't understand what God said, then you don't you you can't be reminded of the fact that God said you can have everything. If your emotions weren't overwhelming you at, because you were guided, your emotions were being guided and given to the word of God, then you would have realized I have everything and there is nothing, absolutely nothing that this fruit can do for me that I don't already have everywhere at all times. But what happened? The grand conspirator did what he did and he did it well. And here's the thing that's really funny, folks. It's not funny. It's, it's tragic. It's actually really sad. The Bible doesn't even give us an indication, not even close. There's nothing that we see in the Bible that indicates the fact that Adam resisted. As a matter of fact, Adam not only did not resist, he immediately took it. And then, knowing that he fully disobeyed God, was willing to throw his wife under the bus because he didn't want to take responsibility. Get that? And then guess what happened? He converted Eve to a co-conspirator. The conspiracy was effective in that it destroyed Adam and it destroyed all of humanity. Because the Bible tells us later on that through one man, sin entered the world. Through one man, sin entered the world. I think there's a really important picture here, a critical picture. We don't get this. This is how Satan works. Satan is very, 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 very good at what he does, folks. He is very good, and he will seek to eliminate people in a way that maximizes the casualties. That's what he'll do. Now, folks, there is so much going on around us that is very clearly, very clearly, there is evidence of the fact that the devil is doing what the devil is doing and that this is, there are conspiracies everywhere because this is the devil's world right now. We right now in the current moment, folks, listen to me, we are living in the devil's world. So the devil has everything at his fingertips to do what he wants to do in order to affect and accomplish his purposes.